And what we want to talk about today in this second edition was basically the integration of body processes in response to our environment. Um, our bodies are uh, being sampled all the time. In other words, what we're talking about here in this particular uh, discussion is that uh, our body is sampling everything around us, within us, all the time, every minute of every day, all the time. And it's trying to keep the body at some within some very narrow range of normal, okay? And it does this by uh, sampling everything and then sending a message to a certain control center. And that control center is gonna either decide if it's good or if it's bad. If it's bad, then what we do is we change it. If it's good, just leave it alone, okay? And so the body is constantly doing this. It uses a number of different body processes to try to create this uh, uh, situation where we stay at this narrow range of normal. That is what we call homeostasis. The body's constantly adjusting and adapting and correcting and overcorrecting and undercorrecting and, and getting things back into this normal to keep that train on the tracks. And this is what we call homeostasis. And the reason why we have homeostasis is the body likes to be the same all the time. There's no two, but, two ifs, ands, or buts about that. The body likes to be the same all the time. And therefore, what happens is every, every day, every minute of every day, of every week, of of every month of uh, the body's making changes to try to get us to where we need to be. Uh, simple chemi chemicals that are in our body, the body is moving around, um, is, is making adjustments so that we could uh, keep these levels of certain chemicals pretty consistent. Um, uh, and so there are a number of different factions, and we'll talk about those as this time goes on. So what what is going on really here? Life's really the coordination of a number of body processes and, and conditions. Um, even though we're sitting here, maybe watching Netflix, watching Tiger King or whatever the case may be on Netflix, you know, the body doesn't take a rest. There are a number of body processes going on all the time uh, to try to keep the body moving and running. You know, it's like, you know, I, I, you know we've seen during uh, uh, COVID-19, you know, companies stopping and nothing working. Well, the body can't be like that. The body has to continue to work. And a number of body processes continue to go on whether we're whether paying any attention to them or not. Okay, and what happens is that some of these body processes and body systems working together provide us with some level of existence. Okay, and this is basically what it, what it has to do is to coordinate what happens within me with what happens outside me. Okay, it's looking at and uh, coordination of our internal and external environment, and then making the little minute adjustments so that I could work efficiently and productively okay so this response this often requires some type of response of a body system to keep us on that narrow tight rope where everything stays the same all the time and this is an inter interdependence between two things number one the body is a system of a number of um, sensors uh, some of them are external such as touch and temperature and everything like that on the outside but we also have the body as a series of a number of, of, of effectors and effectors are what actually if there's something the sensor detects as being wrong it sends a signal to a control center and then the control center has to send a signal to an effector to uh, to create an appropriate response to get everything back into normal okay so it's a it's a it's a combination of both the stimuli looking in, in and sampling of what's going on as well as our body's response to that and that's where these body uh, body processes and systems come together okay Okay. The problem is that when one goes wrong, when I have one body system or a process that all of a sudden just can't work right, this results in some type of a problem. And frequently, when I involve one system that's going wrong, it requires another system to make up for what that first system can't do, which then requires that second system to go wrong, and that really requires a third system to try and make up. And it's, it's, it's called compensation. So the body's trying to make compensations all the time just to try to keep me in that homeostatic control, okay? Uh, so if we don't make these, okay, uh, things happen. So what are the consequences if I if I if I, I I have a difficult time adapting to changes within me or changes outside me? Well, the first problem is well, first of adapt, uh, adaptation. The problem is adaptation is something called evolution. 
okay? Uh, we evolved. The body has evolved to be able to do certain things, okay? Uh, you know, uh, we've evolved to live in a certain uh, temperature or climate environment. We've evolved that, that what happens is our respiratory system realizes that the air in the, in the uh, atmospheric air has a higher concentration of oxygen than my, in, in the blood that goes back to the lungs, and therefore uh, I'm able to extract a little bit more of that oxygen from the air and put it into my blood. So we make these adaptations, but they're over a long period of time. So adaptation is really not much of a, of a consideration here. But the problem is if these body systems or body processes start to falter and they don't work the way they, 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 they're they supposed to, what this does is it produces illness or disease. Okay, And that's what we don't want to happen. No man is an island unto himself. What I mean by that is that we have to live and exist in a particular environment. Okay, So we have to have all these uh, internal and external factors in my body uh, that are, are sampled to be able to direct our existence and that's what we talk about with homeostasis. We like things to be the same. I don't know about you guys, but uh, um, if I go to a particular restaurant, I always order the same thing at a, at a restaurant. If I go to one place, this is what I order. If I go to this place, because like, you know what? I like it the same. Why? Because it's always been good and I, chances are if I get it again, it's going to be good again. And the body likes the same thing. So it has to constantly sample everything in my internal and external environment, all the things inside me, pressure inside inside my vessels, the chemicals running through my blood, the chemicals between my cells, how my cells are functioning, everything, providing nutrients to those for, for fuels to be able to be able to uh, make energy, all kinds of things. They all have to work together to be able to, to guide me. And this requires a really fine-tuned process of the, of the body um, uh, to be able to uh, sample everything that's going on. It's sort of like a, sort of like you know, like a, a taste tester. You know, if you have a guy before the food goes out, they might taste it to see if it looks, oh, it's just right. You know, that sauce is just perfect, and let's go ahead and let that let that sauce go out. But uh, that's the same thing here. The body is constantly sampling things, and when things get a little bit off track, the body has to make some type of an adjustment to get back. Okay, and that's what the body is is um, needing to do, and that's what we call homeostasis. The body likes the same things all the time. It likes to be the state. It likes to be stable. It likes to be the same all the time. And that's what we're going to be talking about here. Now, there are a number of life processes. We're going to talk just a little bit about each of those. Things such as organization, the way the body's organized, uh, metabolism, how I use fuel, how I build things up in the body, responsiveness, responsiveness, how I respond to certain changes in, in my internal or external environment, um, movement, and what movement is really uh, helpful in regards to um, uh, you know making me able to ad adjust or adapt to whatever these changes in my internal external environment would be growth differentiation reproduction so let's get started let's just talk about those things to begin with let's first talk, talk about organization Organization is one of the things that really differentiates us from other inanimate objects, like a rock. You know, how is a rock organized? Well, basically, there's that hard part here, and there's a hard part there, and maybe there's a little shiny thing in here and stuff like that. But that's that's all there is to organization. The body um, is an organism. Uh, it has to be organized so things work together. They can't work against each other. They have to work together. In other words, one system d relies upon the adequate performance of another system. Typical example, if I get that oxygen into my lungs, I still have to deliver it to the tissues, which requires the cardiovascular system to work with the respiratory system. Okay. If I want those cells to work, I could deliver them the oxygen, but I also have to deliver them nutrients uh, from things that have been ingested and broken down to molecular sized particles so they could get in the blood to be able to deliver it for nutrients and fuels at the cellular level. So everything has to work together. And then they produce waste. What do the waste do? They have to be gotten rid of. What the kidneys have to work. So everything has an organization that, uh, you know, everything has to be organized in such a way that um, one thing. Uh, can, can depend upon the other and de depend upon the other to do its own job, okay? Which is sort of like sort of boundaries or every every well, every system or thing has a certain uh, uh, thing that they must do. They all affect all these other systems, okay? We have to live within this environment. In other words, all these systems have been made to be able to uh, adhere to what the requirements are in my environment, temperature and stuff like that. If we took us and all of a sudden we were into uh, put it into an environment where we have 15% uh, uh, you know, uh, oxygen in the atmospheric air, guess what? We die, okay? Simply because it, the, uh, the, the uh, oxygen content in the blood 
would be would be higher than that. We'd never absorb any and stuff like that through through the lungs. So we have a problem with that, and we just don't have a long enough time to be able to adapt or to evolve to change things like that. Okay. Uh, again, are there also specific organism conditions? So that's what's going on around me and what's inside me. If I took everybody in the class and said, okay, here's what I want you to do: bring in a vial of blood for extra credit next week, and um, or drop it off, and because we're going to be online for a while in, in some of these cases, uh, drop it off, and I'll check your blood. I'd be willing to bet you that what happens is most of the chemi chemicals that I see, most of the elements and atoms and stuff like that that I see in your blood are going to be consistent from one person to another because we're all adapted to live within this certain environment or these, these various conditions, okay? We have to maintain the integrity of these systems, though, once they're going to be able to, to, to live. If they don't, like I mentioned, when one system fails, it puts taxation on other systems or other body processes, and as a result, the result end result down the road is the organism will die okay and we don't want that to happen so therefore everybody functions within a specific internal and external environment and the organization of my body is such that we're able to live within that environment you know and you know like this guy you know I mean obviously he's been adapted to live in a water environment he and I have probably the same bodies but no, no we don't I'm joking okay that's not even close okay but on the other hand I uh, he, he could live in water I can't live in water okay so as a result and of course that's fictional so I mean we're taking this just a little bit extreme here. But anyway, you know what I mean. I hope you got the idea here. We live within a particular environment and our body systems and our body processes are developed at this point that make me live maximally within that particular environment, both internal environment, what goes on inside me, as well as what I have to experience outside my body. That's organization. Metabolism. Metabolism is really basically nothing more than the sum of the chemical processes that occur in my body. Uh, whether you're awake, whether you're asleep, there's things going ha happening all the time. Processes are going on all the time. I'm making fuel. I'm breaking things down. I'm building things up. The body never sleeps. Okay. Uh, typical example. Uh, what, what are some of these uh, things that we use for fuel? Oxygen is taken in, you know, through the air, like we talked about a minute ago. <clears throat> and the oxygen is really important because what happens is fuels burn better in the presence of oxygen. We make more energy when oxygen is present. So that's it. We also take in the nutrients. <clears throat> you go out and you get a Big Mac and eat the Big Mac, guess what? You don't see a Big Mac floating around your blood. But what you do is you find molecular bite-sized particles, uh, actually much more than uh, molecular bites, okay, small molecules. They're small enough to be able to be broken down in the, in the gastrointestinal system to be absorbed across the wall of the intestine to be able to get in the blood, okay? And I use those as nutrients, okay? Respiration, a word respiration is going to come up a little bit later, and basically that's the absorption and the transport and the use of oxygen. And again, that's really important. We talked a little about how the oxygen in the atmosphere is higher than the oxygen, oxygen level in the blood when it gets back to the lungs, and therefore by simple diffusion, we'll talk about diffusion in an upcoming lecture, uh, the oxygen goes from the air through the wall of these little air sacs in the lung called alveoli into the capillaries so I could deliver it to the rest of the body okay and that's called respiration and then finally it gets to the cells and the oxygen concentration in the cells is less because it's used it up to make energy than in the blood so now it goes from the blood into the cells or into the uh, fluid around the cells the extracellular fluid you know and basically we use fuels nutrients are broken down to provide chemical energy okay to power the cells while we think about that Big Mac or the Mr. Hero one thing or another or a, a Whopper or whatever you want to talk about uh, or a Chipotle okay or whatever the case may be it's still the same thing what happens is um, what do we why do we take that I mean why do we need those things it needs it because each living cell in my body needs energy and I have to provide some energy or fuel source to every living cell in my body Okay, they need it to make energy. And so as a result, what happens, I need these nutrients that can be broken down in my gastrointestinal system to a molecular size that they could get in my circulation, that could be delivered to the cells. The cells can, can uh, uh, via the uh, 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 cardiovascular system, and then the cells can get them inside the cell and use those for energy. Typical example is glucose. You know, glucose is a, is a carbohydrate which is commonly used as energy. And the reason why it's used for energy, which is nice, is because it's a clean burning fuel. Fuel. Glucose is C6H12O6, and when we metabolize fuel, when we break it, uh, metabolize glucose and break it down, it breaks down to carbon dioxide and water. What do we do with the carbon dioxide? We breathe it out. What do we do with the, with the water? We pee it out. 
Okay, so as a result, uh, this is this is this is all about metabolism. But the cells do need that. Uh, we do need that glucose. Now that glucose can only get inside the cell by the help of another system, by the help of the endocrine system. The endocrine system then secretes a hormone called insulin. Insulin circulates around the blood. It binds to receptors on the surface of the cells to open up portals to let the glucose get in. Okay, so I need that. Uh, so what is metabolism? Is breakdown of larger molecules into smaller molecules for building uh, for bodies building structural components. In other words, I need to be able to to make uh, to to use the um, uh, nutrients that I take and and turn them into fuel, as well as in the second situation here, I need to be able to build things. Uh, the body cells are constantly dying. We have cells that are dying all the time. And when they die, I have to replace those cells with other cells. And how do I replace them with other cells? I need to build those things. And as a result, I need some building blocks. I need, I need uh, human uh, Legos to be able to build things to make these cells to make to make um, make the body function. Okay. So we have uh, um, uh, cells that need to be made, and I need certain uh, structural components to make these cells. Typical example: What's a protein? Well, if you've taken any type of chemistry, you know protein is a clump of amino acids. And amino acids are a bunch of amino acids. And they're held together in a, in, and they're folded and they're bent back and forth and stuff like that into a larger molecule. Proteins are usually large, large molecules. But when the body eats a protein, it doesn't gain as much energy from the protein, but what it does is it breaks down the protein and takes these amino acids and puts them in the body, and they put into, they go into an amino acid pool. So when the body needs to make a protein, which is actually dictated by my genetic code, okay, it's in my DNA, to make that protein, what we find is the body needs to dip into this amino acid pool to take the appropriate amount of, of amino acids and the, and the right order to be able to line them up in a long chain and then bend them over and stuff like that. So I do need nutrients, not just for fuel, but also for building blocks to make other things. When you get a cut, guess what? You heal with some type of a material in between. You have a little fibroblast to come in and lay down collagen across that area of the cut, and that area will fill in. I need to add, I need to have something to build that, and those nutrients will help to do that. Now, there are two words I think I want you to know, okay? Two words I think are really important. The first one is called catabolism. Catabolism is breaking things down. So, in other words, what we're talking about in this situation, this part of my, this part of my meta metabolic profile, the catabolism is taking those nutrients and breaking them down so that I'm able to use those as fuels or possible for building blocks later on. And that's called catabolism. Things are broken down. On the other hand, the word you should know, other word you should know, is anabolism. Anabolism is building things up. So what happens if I need a certain enzyme or if I need a certain protein for something? The body has to make it. Where's that? How does the body know how to make it? Well, that's the secret of DNA. DNA is basically not blue eyes, blonde hair, and stuff like that. But DNA is a, a complex uh, molecule, like we talked about in our previous discussion, that actually has the code for how to make body proteins. Okay, so what happens is that code is got is gotten from the DNA, and it allows us to make the protein according to what we need. Okay, and that's building it up. When I build it from scratch and put it together, that's called anabolism. That's called anabolism. So basically, like I said, the body's sort of like you know all these building blocks that we have the Legos, and then you know eventually we have to get rid of some of them as called waste. Okay, but that's that. Another body process that we talk about is responsiveness and adaptability. Okay, what this means is that things in our environment are not always the same, even though we want them to be the same. Okay, we talked at the very beginning about how we have receptors which will detect changes in the internal and external environment. Okay. Well, the body has to be able to respond to that, and that's what we call responsiveness or adaptability. The body's ability to detect and respond to changes in my internal and external environment is required to be able to make those changes, to be, get you back on track. And this is sort of sometimes called irritability, okay? Such as, let's take uh, um, changes in body temperature, okay? We live in a perfect environment where the temperature is this range to this range. I know my son just just called and said it's going to be 100 degrees where he lives in uh, in Las Vegas. Okay, and um, you know uh, we can live within 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 a range. However, what happens is the most important thing is I have to worry about my internal temperature. Okay, and the internal temperature is what we call the core temperature. It's in the center of the body, from the head to the chest to the abdomen. That's where all the major organs are, and those organs work best at a particular temperature. Ah, oh, 90. 
98.6, 98 to about 99, somewhere in that range, that narrow range of what's normal. It works best in that range. If I put, if I take myself and put myself into a very frigid environment, okay, where all of a sudden now my body's exposed to a lot of, a lot of cold, the body perceives this by external thermal receptors, and what it does is it starts to shunt blood or shift blood from the extremities to the core. So in other words, the blood supply to my hands and uh, arms, my legs, my feet goes down and the blood supply to the center of my body increases because now I've shifted the blood supply centrally as compared to peripherally. Okay, And that allows me to keep warmth inside my body and keep these uh, major organs that keep me running, you know, uh, up, up, and up and going. Okay, uh, if it turns out that I can't respond to that, and all of a sudden I get continue to get colder, what's eventually going to happen is that central core temperature goes down. What happens? Body processes start to fail, and as a result, death ensues. Same thing like every summer, you'll see uh, somebody out when it gets hot and, and, and humid. Somebody you'll see a, a high school football player or something like that dies of um, hyperthermia. What happens is their body temperature goes up. It's sort of like I can't say boils because it never gets to that that high, but their temperature goes up to you know 105, 106, 107, 108 degrees in their core temperature, and the and the body organ says I can't do that. But normally in our normal environment, we're able to adapt. We're able to make those adjustments because I've, the body's been, I've been trained or conditioned or adapted or modified to live within that very narrow range of normal. Okay, so and cells will respond in different ways to this. On nerve cells, you know, like I say, if if I, if I if you touch something hot, you'll pull your hand off. Why? You know, if it's going to burn you. Why? Because that heat sends a signal out. Okay, and that signal goes to the brain to say, hey, get your hand off that hot thing, stupid, and you'll pull your hand off that hot thing, okay, so you don't get burned. Muscle, muscles will con contract to generate force. Let's talk about that cold person. One of the other things, and talk about the inner relationship and the inner digitation of different body systems, okay. Now, I'm trying to keep my core temperature warm. What happens when you get cold? Of course, you shiver. And what happens is you shiver, and the shivering is basically muscles. And when muscles are contracting really fast and shivering, no, I'm not having a seizure. When the muscles are contracting and working really fast, what do they do? They produce heat. And that heat is then is then transferred to my core, core temperature. So this is just something we see with the adaptive responsiveness and adaptability. The body has certain limits. Again, it's, it's, it's set to work within a certain range of what those internal and external environments, uh, environmental limits would be, uh, and it needs to, and it wants to adjust to keep it within there. So if it goes outside that a little bit one way, outside that a little bit the other way, it has to be able to respond and adapt. Okay, such as these guys who uh, maybe after a drought they're looking for a little puddle somewhere to get their little feet wet or something like that. Okay, movement. Movement uh, is could be is is broken down to multiple areas. You know, when you say movement, you say, oh, I'm gonna throw a ball, I'm gonna walk, I'm gonna run, I'm gonna do this or whatever the case may be. But that's okay. That's that's one type of movement that we see. On the other hand, my body is moving all the time. Your heart's beating from you know uh, very early embryonically. Okay, it's beating early on. It beats until the, the time you die. It's moving. Okay, um, when you're sitting there trying to be quiet, you know, you're 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 it's, you don't want to be called on in class, and you're sitting there really quiet, and all of a sudden, you know, you're sitting there, and all of a sudden you hear, and then your stomach starts to growl, and your belly sounds like there's a bunch of geese flying around inside there. Basically, that's peristalsis. We'll talk about peristalsis later on in the semester. What happens is this is actually muscular contractions of the wall of the intestine, the stomach that's moving fluid and material throughout the intestine to make room. Okay, so we have those. We also have, if you look at the individual cell, you'll actually see, if you looked at them under on a very high powered microscope, you'll actually see movement inside the cells. Things are moving around. There's activity going on inside the cells. So movement goes all the way from the organism as a whole to individual uh, organs themselves to individual cells. Okay, so these are some things we talked about the muscle contraction. Uh, white blood cells. You know, white blood cells fight infection. Okay, there's a, there's a bunch of different types of white blood cells, and some of them do a diff, do, do, do a few different things. But white cells. Um, uh, fight infection. If I have an area where there's invasion by bacteria, what happens is the white cells are taught to migrate to that area to help to fight that infection. Basically, it's a cellular migration. We talked about the peristalsis of the intestines. We talked about movement of organelles. Organelles are the small little pieces, parts inside the cells. And these things are all moving all the time. So that's a part of my body process. When things don't move, guess what? We're in trouble. 
you know. Uh, one really good bowel movement. Oh, well, that's, an, that's an, uh, talking about old guys. Forget that. Okay. Anyway, let's go to growth. Okay. Growth means is another body process, which is an increase in body size from an increase in the number of cells or increase in cell size. Okay. And this happens uh, in multiple areas. Obviously, you know, you, you, uh, for some reason, when I got to about five, six, five, six and a half, I stopped growing. Okay. We'll talk a little about growth and where growth occurs in bones at the growth plates uh, in probably a couple weeks. We'll talk about that. But we have a growth in the body and size as well as in the, in, this, in, 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 the, in the number of cells as well as in the size cell. Okay. We also have growth because of increased in intracellular, extracellular space. Uh, things that are inside the cell are called intracellular. The, and, but it's, 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 this is sort of unusual to believe. You look at yourself as a solid object, but guess what? You're mostly fluid. And around each of those cells, you're surrounded with a lot of fluid. We're held in by a membrane on the outside called the epithelium of the skin. But inside, there's a lot of fluid that's between all the cells. Things are a little moist on the inside. And so, so, so you know, we could grow from extracellular space growth by extra fluid. That's like swelling and stuff like that, as well as in increase in body size in the cell number or, or cell size. Okay. Um, obviously, uh, when you talk about the um, miracle of life, you have a spermatozoa meets an ovum, all of a sudden you have one cell becomes two cells, two cells become four cells, that's called a zygote, four cells become eight cells, eight cells become 16. It keeps on getting larger and larger and starts to, starts to change after a while, which we'll talk about coming up soon, called differentiation. But what happens is we get an increased number of cells, and we finally get to a certain point where we've reached our maximal limit and we just keep on replacing the older cells. On the other hand, old guys, don't look at me that way, you're looking at the bottom picture and you're saying, oh, no, he's talking about stuff. But old guys, what happens is testosterone in, in, in males after about 45, 50, 55 years of age, testosterone changes. Um, there's an a, a enzyme that becomes, uh, or a gene that becomes activated in our DNA that produces what's called a reductase enzyme. And this reductase enzyme takes testosterone and converts it to dihydrotestosterone, or DHT. The DHT then circulates through the body, but it likes one place, okay? It's still a strong testosterone, but the DHT does actually two things. It causes male pattern baldness, so people start to get a little bit thinner on the top. The second thing it does, it actually attaches to receptors on the surface of a gland that only males have called the prostate gland, which is just below the bladder. It goes around the urethra, the tube that takes the urine to the outside. It attaches to receptors on this prostate gland and causes these cells to get bigger. As a result, the prostate in older men get bigger, which starts to squeeze off the urethra, which means why a lot of the old guys are grunting and groaning when they're trying to pass their urine because that's what happens with that. So that's called growth. Growth is another important factor that we get in regards to one of our basic life processes. Okay? Keep your nose clean. Keep growing. I'll have you out of here in another six months. Hey, there's just a method of growth. Okay? Now, that gets me to differentiation, which I briefly mentioned before. Differenti differentiation means um, an unspecialized cell turns into a specialized cell with a specialized function. This, and there, there's many different cells that we have in the body. I mean, if we look at all the different cells, liver cells are different from kidney cells, are different from cardiac muscle cells, are different from skeletal muscle cells, are different from smooth muscle cells, are different from neurons. All these cells are different. But you know what? When you think about it, they came from a zygote, and the zygote was the same cell. That one cell became two. Guess what those two cells, guess what the difference between those two cells were? Right, nothing. Those two cells become four cells. Guess what the difference between those four cells were? Right, nothing. Same thing with eight, same thing with 16. However, at a certain point during development, these cells say, hmm, time to do something different. I'm gonna branch off. I'm gonna decide that I wanna do something different from what I am now. And what happens, they start to specialize. Okay, uh, and so as a result, we start to get a different structure and function of these cells that are much more defined than what they started as. Now, what, what, how do they start? What happens is we have certain cells in the body which are called stem cells. Okay, and stem cells are unspecialized cells. They don't know what they want to do. They're sort of like, eh, I don't know. I'll wait till I grow up. I'll wait till maybe I'll watch something and decide what I want to be after I want. Yeah, they don't know what they want to be. But what happens? These stem cells underneath inappropriate stimulus from the body, whether it be a chemical stimulus or a physical stimulus or whatever the case may be, that stem cell can be told what type of cell to become. Okay, And so they become much more specialized. Very typical example. If I have a very low number of red blood cells, anemia, okay, my red blood cell count goes down. 
what happens is in the bone marrow and blood cells are made as we probably know in the bone marrow okay in only certain areas of the bone marrow they're made in the bone marrow what happens inside the bone marrow about one to two percent of all the cells in the bone marrow are called stem cells and they're just sitting there waiting for instructions what am I gonna do okay who can somebody tell me what I want to be when I grow up I don't know what happens is if my red blood cell calls goes down there are stimuli such as one from the kidney one from the kidney the kidney detects that and the kidney sends out a hormone called erythropoietin and the erythropoietin then goes to the bone marrow and tells the bone marrow stem cells we need more red cells now pronto and as a result now the now the now the bone marrow starts to make more red cells from a stem cell so basically differentiation just says I have an immature unspecialized cell that underneath the right stimulus starts to become a specialized cell and they're actually doing a lot of stem cell research they're able to take cells and make sheets of a particular type of cell because they know what the stimulus is that will make that cell become a specialized cell okay and that's one thing that we see. So, so it's not just from embryo to fetus to infant and stuff like that. But it, this is happening every in you and me. Uh, we have all of us have stem cells, and those stem cells basically are the ones that uh, we rely upon to make other differentiated cells down the road. Okay, so that's it. I know that what happens is as you get older. The, the, like the stem cells in the bone marrow get less okay so the regenerative process in, in, in adults is a little bit slower than in, than in younger people that's why they get bone marrow uh, transplants um, from younger people like under 40 years of age after 40 years of age they don't want your bone marrow much anymore you know because they can't and then basically a lot of times when they get your bone marrow they want the stem cells because the stem cells are the ones that they could actually tell to make certain types of cells if somebody has like a, a leukemia or lymphoma or something like that so for fair selection, everybody has to take has to take the same exam. Please climb that tree. What I'm saying here, and what I'm trying to mean by this little cartoon, is that you know what? They all started out as a cell, okay? But what happens? They all are different, and that's just differentiation. So One, you know, crow, monkey, elephant, goldfish, seal, dog, or wolf, or whatever you got down there. Anyway, they all became different, and that's differentiation. Reproduction. Reproduction is not just uh, to create uh, offspring or progeny, but also the, re the, the formation of new cells for growth, uh, tissue growth, repair, and replacement. We're constantly losing cells all the time. We're constantly losing cells. You know, believe it or not, what happens is your skin, there's multiple layers in the outer layer, the epidermis of your skin. They actually, the, the cells that are really alive are the deeper ones. So the, it's the basal layer, the one right between the, where the epidermis stops and the dermis, which is below it, starts. That's this is this basal layer. And what happens is though there the cells are alive, but they continue to mature and they go to the outside and they constantly be shed off. They're constantly being shed off. Okay, we're leaving shells all, cells all over the place. So make sure you clean up after yourself. Okay, what happens is you're leaving cells. They're just wiping off. You're brushing against something, you know, and there's cells, whether you want to leave them or not. Okay, so I have to repair. I need need growth. I need new cells, and I need to reproduce these things. And that's what we get into things like cell division. We'll talk more about cell division when we talk a little bit more about DNA down the road. Okay, we'll talk a little bit more about cell division. So we need to uh, we need reproduction, not just for for an for a spermatozoa to affect an ovum to create a new offspring, but we also need reproduction for new cells in my own body now to be able to, to, to form, uh, to repair things that are broken. Uh, when bone breaks, um, well, this is interesting, when, when a bone breaks, I know if you've had a, had a fracture, uh, a fractured bone, when a bone breaks, what happens is old bone is taken away. You have certain cells that will come in, we'll talk about this in class, certain cells called osteoclasts that come in and take bone away, they resorb bone, and the bone actually looks like a, a lot more taken taken away after about about 10 days to two weeks you actually see where the bones been actually taken away a little bit and then what happens is certain other cells called uh, osteoblasts come in and they lay down collagen in a way and then what happens is they finally get engulfed inside this collagen when they get soft engulfed inside this collagen they actually make more bone cells and these bone cells become osteocytes which are mature bone cells and it heals that union between the two we'll talk a lot more of that specifically when we get into the osseo section but basically we need those cells to be able to help us for reproduction and to replace things that are broken or to repair or things that are lost okay that's important uh, but we're talking about reproduction dad he's hitting me Dad, tell her to stay on her own side ouch stop it three junior meals and a vasectomy please and that's what some parents start to feel like after a while but hey they love them whatever the case okay death 
Death is the response of basically the cessation of life processes. When I think about um, all these life processes that keep me in that even keel, that keep me in that narrow range of normal, when I can't do that anymore, one thing goes bad, which causes another process to go bad, another system to go bad, which causes another process and system to go bad, which causes another. Eventually, it all shuts down. Okay, and that's what cessation of life process, cessation of life, uh, basic processes is basically what we call death. Okay, and this is could be on both on the cellular level as well as the organism level. Again, we have cells um, every day that are dying. Okay, just because they're old, uh, every day uh, our red blood cells are only made to last about 100, 120 days. After 120, 100, 120 days, they're actually gulped up by the spleen. The spleen takes them and mulches them up, and basically takes and reuses the iron uh, again, sticks it back in the circulation, and takes the protein and does something and repurposes that protein into something else, which we'll talk about in the GI section, which is actually really cool. Okay, so that's just a little teaser, so you'll stick around, so you'll listen about what's going to happen in the GI system. Okay, now. We've talked so much about physiology, but we need to talk about this class is also anatomy, okay? And anatomy is basically a study of the organ systems that we have, their structure and their location and their relationship to other organ systems, okay? Not as much as how they work, but their location. Where they are and how they work does have an effect in regards to the, you know, what their structure is and stuff like that. And we'll talk about that as when we get to each individual organ system as we go through the course of the semester. So, so uh, you know, first of all, let's talk about autopsy, okay? What is an autopsy? Well, if you ever get a chance to, to see a, a real autopsy, go, okay? You'll never see anything that's quite like that, okay? Unless you go to, the, uh, what is it, uh, uh, the, the uh, body, whatever it is, where they uh, aplastinate people and then they explode them and you can see all these body parts, which actually actually real body parts, but they inject, but they, they stick them and they absorb a lot of this glycerin and a plastic material that make them hard. So they're really body parts, but they're made hard, okay? So what autopsy is, is basically a post-mortem dissection. It's after someone dies, they take and they look and to see, look at the organs, okay? Now there's a number of reasons why people do autopsies. Number one is to determine the cause of death, which is common. If someone dies from suspicious means or there's no reason why they passed away, what they'll do is they'll do an autopsy to be able to determine why they died, which is, uh, is it natural causes or is it not natural causes, such as a homicide or whatever the case may be, you know? It's also to undercover, uncover the the existence of various diseases. What this means is sometimes you're not quite sure what the problem is, but you want to know. And so as a result, they could actually see if there's a certain disease process going on within somebody. But then again, that's like, you know, after death, you know, which could be a problem. Uh, also, sometimes we use an autopsy to determine the extent of injury. So in other words, let's say somebody has multiple bullet holes. Well, which is the fatal one? Which is the one that killed them? You know, they, might, they might be able to survive multiple ones, but there might be one that is, is the fatal one. So determine the extent of injury, also from trauma, other types of trauma, to determine, determine what may have happened. Uh, it's an explanation of death, basically. Also provides statistical data. In other words, by autopsy, they're able to determine things such as prevalence of a disease. In other words, maybe they don't know what's going on, but the only way they can tell is by autopsy, and they can tell the statistical data about that, okay? Um, and so, so that's important. You know, to, to be able to look at numbers, you know, how common is something, and sometimes autopsy will tell how common a certain anatomical variation or an anatomical condition might be. Also, it's involving uh, conditions which may involve uh, siblings and offspring, okay? And this is something that, uh, that sometimes comes into autopsy. Now, on a personal note, if you were to ask me, Dr. Lichnack, do you like music? I say, yeah, I like music. I like to sit there with my MP3 player in my car. I have certain you know, uh, uh, playlists that I like, and I play that stuff, and I like a wide range of music from a lot of different things. But the thing that I don't like, if you say, do you have a band that you like? I could give you a, a bunch, you know? And the problem is most of the people that were in the bands that I liked are all dead now. That's a problem, I can't see them. But what happens is they say, do you have a band that you didn't like? I would say, oh, that comes to my, oh. Yeah, I didn't have to think twice. Boom, it's right there. The Bee Gees. Oh, jeez. If I hear the Bee Gees, I break out in hives. I just can't stand it. I'm not a fan of disco to start out with. And I was like, oh, my gosh. They just annoyed me, okay, the Bee Gees. Well, what happens, what, where, we, where we're getting to this is that one of the Bee Gees uh, developed abdominal pain. And they didn't know what the abdominal pain was. And they fooled around and fooled around and fooled around. And eventually, he died from his abdominal pain. They couldn't figure out what it was, okay? So guess what? Because they didn't know 
they did what? They did an autopsy. They looked inside to try to figure out what was going on. Okay, and they did an autopsy and found out that he had something called a volvulus. And a volvulus is where the intestines will actually twist. Okay, the intestines, the small intestines, uh, aren't like free-floating sausages hanging from a rack, you know, inside the abdomen. But what they are is they're attached to the backside of the abdominal wall by a membrane, which is basically the same membrane that lines the inside wall of the abdomen as well as covers all the organs, called the peritoneum. And this membrane goes back to the backside of the abdominal wall. It's called the mesentery. What happens is sometimes, and the mesentery is the is the way blood vessels and nerves get from the aorta, which is on the backside of the abdominal wall, out to the intestines, which are floating around. You can't have a bunch of strings going all over through the through the, through the abdomen. So you, they go through this mesentery. Okay. Well, anyway, what happened is this mesentery twists. When it twists, because the blood vessels are in there, what do you think it does to the blood vessel? It shuts them off. That blood vessel gets cramped closed and gets shut off. Therefore, the blood supply to the intestine dies. It's gone. No good. And, and, the intestine, and the intestine itself dies. So therefore, he ended up with a gangrenous intestine. Couldn't save him. He died. Well, to make a long story even a little bit longer, uh, his brother, one of his brothers, another of the remaining, there were three BGs, now there's two, another brother down the road um, developed abdominal pain. And when they started looking at the family history, they realized his, his other brother had a volvulus. They were able to evaluate him, found out that he too had a volvulus, which is not common, but may occur in siblings, and boom, they were able to correct it. Darn it, okay? But they were able to correct it, okay? And they were able to un, untwist that intestine, and therefore it survived, okay? So sometimes finding conditions which may involve siblings or offsprings, okay, um, and stuff like that. Uh, also, autopsy helps us to, to gain you know, intellectual growth about certain disease states. And about you know what? To be truthful with you right now, anatomy is pretty well for the most part, you know, probably 95% well explained. We know what the anatomy is. I mean, things, there, there have been a number of uh, bodies that have been cut up that you're able to tell what's going on in the body. Um, pretty much. There are certain little nuances. And to be truthful with you, almost every one of you, I'm going to scare you a little bit, but almost every one of you out there probably has some little variation somewhere. Something's not a little bit off kilter. And that's because so many things could happen as we develop. Okay. So it helps us to develop a, a, a continual intellectual growth about disease and about anatomical structure, which is also very helpful. Okay. Attention. Attention. Okay. No, no, I got to do this officially. Attention. The following information contains graphic viewing material. Viewer discretion is strongly advised. Okay. Got it? Okay. Anyway, let's go. Anyway, you know, autopsy is basically, it's pretty gross. I mean, when you look at that, sometimes, you know, the, the material that you have to work with, you know, isn't, isn't the greatest. Okay. And basically it's, 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 uh, um, having a basis, a basic understanding of anatomy to be able to find out what's going on. Okay. And that's what we see with a lot of these autopsies. I'm stumped. We'll have to wait for the autopsy. If you hear that from a doctor, run. Okay. As fast as you can get out. You know, don't even, if, you, if your shoes are off, leave them. Go. Okay. That's not a good. So let's just talk a little bit about where our anatomical knowledge came from. For centuries, for centuries, and that's centuries, that's not a couple years, this is centuries, people have been cutting up bodies to try to uh, uh, quench the thirst of what the body is all about inside. Okay, I mean, when you look at some of the really very primitive writings, some of the things that people expected about the body, oh my gosh, humors and all kinds of crazy stuff like that, you know, nothing made sense. But 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 we, we, we actually advanced anatomical knowledge by people dissecting bodies. Okay, now the question is, where'd they get those bodies? Okay, and what happens is if you look at a lot of the art, uh, the, the medical art, literature, what you'll see is you'll see drawings like this all the time. This is basically um, a drawing in, in one of the um, uh, medical um, art books. And you see down in there, there's a table. Somebody's down there. It looks like their belly's open, you know, and there's somebody's doing a procedure on there with all these people looking around. They all have this quest to learn and understand what that anatomical structure would be. There's basically, you know, I mean, everybody probably has some interest in wanting to know what's inside them. 
Okay, and this is another picture. This looks very colonial. If you look at these people, they look colonial, all those crazy looking wigs and stuff like that, you know, and, and the dress that they're wearing and stuff. And obviously dissecting a body. They're dissecting a body here and looking uh, looking at anatomical structure. And this one right here was actually interesting. I found this in a nursing book. And basically these are a bunch of nurses and there's a little body sitting down in there that the guy, that this person right there is actually doing a dissection on to show these nurses about living structure. And this only helps us to understand the body more helps to understand the body more okay so we know that dissection has been going on for a long time but how do we get the bodies how do we get the bodies oh no grave robbing and that was one of the big things that initially happened um, grave robbing was actually a quite lucrative uh, profession in its day okay people didn't really donate their bodies to science like some people do now now when people donate their body to science basically they say I'm gonna donate my body to science and do a good thing well you know what they do that with the body they basically send it to the medical school so they prepare it so they could send it to the medical schools so the medical students could cut it up and see what's inside in most of the cases when bodies are donated that's what happens it's not to you know they don't they don't you know do all kinds of crazy experiments and he's alive or anything like that it's nothing like that but a lot of this started with grave robbing okay and people would actually uh, um, watch for when people had died in their town and then what they do is late at night after the person was buried because you got to do it quick because after a while man it doesn't smell that good and it's gonna be a lot, a lot of liquid you know you don't want to deliver a milkshake to the medical school so what happens is is uh, they'd go and dig up the body and take it take it to uh, the medical schools and the medical schools or anatomical institutions would then cut them off to learn that medical uh, knowledge about anatomy if you actually look at Leonardo da Vinci's drawings about the human body it's amazing how not only how good they are uh, artistically but how accurate they are there's a lot of really good material how do you think he got that it's not that one night Leonardo fell asleep and woke up in the morning and says I know what the heart looks like now it's not like that he actually was actually to able there and, and and to see and to help in these dissections to be able to see what the heart looked like look at the structures look at the orientation of the blood vessels in the structures and even that long ago uh, his his drawings were, were really accurate okay to many to, I mean there are a couple changes and so a couple things he might have gotten wrong but most of it was really really good so you know what people didn't really like to have their family members um, dug up and then taken to the medical school and the medical school paid handsome, handsomely for these cadavers especially the fresher they were the better they were okay so they didn't like that so what they did is they started to do other things they started to post family members around the area so that they no one would rob a grave they'd sit around there all night and you know people have people would cover up have a post and look for the guys coming in with shovels after, at midnight you know and then chase them away okay or they would actually sometimes create uh, uh, grids or cages around the uh, area of the crypt so as a result what would happen is nobody could get inside there to rob the grave okay so this was you know this became interesting and another interesting byproduct of this okay is people um, were always afraid of being buried alive okay uh, because at that time medical knowledge wasn't so great to actually always pronounce people dead in fact um, you know they've looked inside some old caskets or old coffins and found out that guess what the person was probably buried and and he wasn't dead now we're sure that they're dead okay when they when they bury him but actually what they did was and people who were afraid this was actually sold to people this was actually uh, marketed and sold and this is a device that so what happens they they took the, the body and they would tie a string to the foot okay and as well as to the arms and the head and what happens is then they take that string and run it up through a tube from the casket up to the outside. So we're outside. So the ground would be up in this level up in here and it runs to the outside. And what do we have out here? We had a bell. Okay. And what would happen is that if someone would wake up inside the casket, they would start to move. And when they start to move, that string would move and would cause that bell to ring and cause that bell to ring okay and so you know this way it was people felt safe oh yeah at least when I'm dead I know I'm dead I'm not gonna wake up in the middle of a casket you know six feet on the ground and and have to try to claw my way out when I know I can't do that okay and this is an interesting tombstone uh, Marjorie McCall lived once buried twice probably saved by the bell hence the term saved by the bell and that's where the term comes from you know because people would have these bell apparatus to let them uh, notify somebody if they were alive saved by the bell okay. one other thing I want to mention about anatomical um, 
uh, knowledge is uh, when when grave robbing became um, pretty uh, suspect and people started to recognize this was happening and they'd go the next day and they'd find out that the, that the hole there'd be a hole with all the dirt you know to the side people didn't carry to care about filling in that dirt just take the body and run okay um, what happened was uh, when people started posting uh, friends neighbors and stuff like that around the grave or enclosing the, the grave in such a way that somebody couldn't get down to do grave robbing for a purpose of anatomical dissection to increase anatomical knowledge there were these two inventive guys uh, William Burke and William Hare okay and they were uh, I think in England England and Scotland somewhere around Ireland whatever the case would be one of those and they and 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 Burke owned a owned a pub okay and what happened it was on a port okay it was on a, a, a port on a southern bay and it's no nothing like that as a as a port okay and what happens is uh, what came into port sailors boats would come in with sailors the sailors would come in there and what happens is sailors are constantly jumping ship in other words when the ship left the next day or the day after that sometimes the sailors wouldn't be there because they just stayed or they got drunk and they fell asleep somewhere and never woke up when the ship was sailing and they were gone they lose their money and that was not a problem they didn't care one way or the other okay they just bring on new 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 sailors sailors would be hanging around the ports just in case they needed somebody to fill in a spot because someone jumped ship okay well William Burke says hey you know what now that people we, we can't grave rob what are we gonna do you know they were getting as much as 10 pounds you know for a body which at that time was huge that was big money okay and his bar was say eh, get a few bucks here a few bucks there but not like the 10 pounds you could get for a good fresh body so what happened is Burke says hmm let's change this around what they did was he and his partner okay William Hare uh, what they do is they get a sailor sloshingly drunk okay and then they take him out back or in the back room after he was sloshingly drunk and again somebody nowhere did miss because he was a sailor could have jumped ship and they would one guy a uh, hair would actually cover his mouth and Burke would sit on his chest well we know when we're gonna find out later on that respirate uh, that, uh, that ventilation requires movement of the chest if the chest can't move guess what when they when they when they used to take witches they used to pile rocks on their chest and they pile rocks in the chest if they still stayed alive they were not a witch if they didn't they were a witch and basically they wouldn't live because they couldn't breathe they couldn't expand their chest so Bert would sit on their chest and compress the chest so they couldn't breathe and they would kill them and then they take them to medical school these guys were really fresh I mean like like they were they probably still had a full bladder of urine you know and stuff like that when they took them to medical school they were that fresh and so um, uh, what happens is Burke and Hare were eventually uh, discovered to do this and actually kill people to, for uh, for money to take them to the medical schools so the medical schools could dissect them. Medical schools could care less as who, where, where the body came from. They just wanted the body to cut it up. Okay, and basically both of them were executed over a period of time. So they murdered at least 16 people to provide fresh bodies, as it says there, to the local anatomy school, and that's what happened. In fact. To carry on the tradition, they call that they called that burking in the name of William Burke. Okay, when they when they compress the chest, it's called burking. Okay, that's just a procedure. So anyway, that's enough. Of that, okay. So uh, other life, basic life process: excitability, conductivity, and contractility. We'll talk about those. You know. Now, what I want to finish this off with is basically going back to where we started. You know take a complete circle what happens is that's this word homeostasis the body likes things the same all the time the body wants to stay in balance it does not like to be out of balance uh, Claude Bernard you know a ton of years ago called it le milieu interior the in, the internal environment okay it's keeping it the same and Walter Cannon actually uh, made this a lot better easier to understand homeostasis homeo means same sameness and stasis means standing still okay or stopping okay so the idea is is homeostasis is a critical function we like things to be in that narrow range when we go outside that narrow range it upsets the apple cart things just don't work quite right okay and it's basically looking and keeping the body in the condition of body equilibrium with this internal and external environment okay so in other words it's constantly sampling everything to keep everything the same all the time and what does this require like we talked about at the very beginning an interplay of body regulatory processes these processes have to work efficiently for this to happen it's constantly happening it's dynamic it's monitored all the time and the function is altered whether you realize it or not your body at the time I've been doing this uh, this crazy uh, PowerPoint video what happens is your body's been doing little minute changes 
little uh, corrections of little errors that are going on, not in what I say, but errors in, in, in what's going on in your body. To keep the body in this balance, to keep that internal environment with what we call within normal limits, WNL, to keep it stable. And that's what the body likes. The body doesn't like anything other than it. It wants to be stable. Okay, And that's sort of like the great Walenda. You know, recently there was one where he walked across the the uh, a volcano. Oh, come on, give me a break. I mean, it was like, oh, he's not going to fall. He's collected, a, connected by a wire, you know, unless the whole thing melts and he falls in the pit of lava. I don't know. And he did across the Niagara Falls again, connected to a wire above. I'm not going to do it, you know, but he did for a lot of money. So this is like what we talk about. When you watch these guys walk, they have that pole. And the pole is moving side to side. Why? To maintain balance. And that's what the body's doing. The body's constantly changing this pole, this balance pole, to keep you on that narrow tight wire, the tight rope, to keep you in balance. Okay? And that's what homeostasis is. It's a constant um, process of of uh, sense, uh, uh, sampling, uh, uh, sending it to someone to see if it's right, and then making a change if it's wrong. Okay, and that's what homeostasis is all about. Okay, and there are a number of things and uh, things that we control homeostatically: the gases in our body, oxygen, carbon dioxide. We have certain levels which we function within normal limits of uh, nutrients, glucose, ions, sodium, potassium, chloride, magnesium, calcium. All these um, ions are important in the right concentration. You know, if I'd ask you right now, what do you think calcium is for? I'd be willing to bet you. I'd be willing to bet you. I'd be willing to bet you that almost everyone out there say strong bones. Yes, that's what. It's, and I'm going to say, eh, you're wrong. Calcium is more important for muscle contraction, nerve conduction, and cardiac muscle contraction. In fact, if my serum calcium levels go down, the body says, I need them for this purpose more than I need it for the hard bone, and takes the calcium on the hard bone to use it in muscle, and use it in cardiac muscle, and use it in nerve. Okay, so those things are that. So we have to keep that level up. And if my calcium levels go down, what happens is I need to absorb more in my diet, or I need to excrete less through my urine to try to keep that blood level of calcium into a nice normal level where my the things that are needed where it's needed most such as in skeletal muscle cardiac muscle and nerve I have enough calcium there okay also in blood clotting calcium is also important in blood blood clotting clotting too our body level of water you know just think about this and you've looked at homeostasis uh, and you probably never thought about it what happens if I drink a lot of fluid your urine looks more like water why because it's mostly water Okay, it's more dilute. And a body wants to have a certain amount of body fluid level. When you get dehydrated, what happens? You get thirsty. It makes you want to drink more to increase your body fluid. And that's part of that homeostasis. Okay? And the kidneys are responsible for either conserving the water if I'm dehydrated or getting rid of too much water or diuresing, getting rid of the water if I have too much water. Okay, temperature, uh, pH. Uh, pH is basically a, a function of hydrogen ion, which is basically acidic, and bicarbonate, which is basic or alkaline. And we can, if I'm too acidic, get rid of some of the hydrogen in the urine. If I'm too basic, get rid of some of the bicarbonate in the urine, and uh, get my get my blood pH back to normal. My blood pH likes to run between about a 7.35 and about 7.45, which is slightly above that neutral. In the, on towards the alkaline side. We'll talk a little bit more about that later on. Uh, temperature has to be adjusted all the time, and, and our volume needs to be constant. Okay, uh, A number of systems are involved. Again, in the temperature, with body temperature, we talk about the skin for evaporation, muscle for shivering, cardiovascular system for shunting of blood, nervous system for sensing the temperatures, body fluid composition. You know, If it's nutrient, you know, digestive system for being able to take the uh, material, the food we eat, and break it down to molecular size bites, cardiovascular system to be able to deliver it, the urinary system to get rid of, of, of some of the uh, metabolites, or when things are finally used for fuel, they're put back in the blood, and I have to get rid of them. How do I get rid of them? In the urine. Oxygen, carbon dioxide level. We're talking about the respiratory system to be able to exchange gases, to bring in oxygen, to get rid of carbon dioxide, as well as the cardiovascular system to deliver the oxygen and to pick up the carbon dioxide in the tissues as a waste gas and bring it back to the lungs for exhaling. Fluid body, fluid volume, and stuff like that. So there are a number of areas, and we'll be talking about homeostasis. The word homeostasis, I, I almost guarantee you, is going to come up almost every lecture. It's going to come up all the time in, when we talk about physiology. Now, what does, you know, uh, this control is basically a constant flux. It's constant motion. There's always a constant adjustment. And basically, any kind of a disruption in my internal environment or external environment causes 
a body response okay and that body response has to be appropriate there are also some psychological and social disruptions but we won't talk about that we're gonna be talking about the physiological disruption disruptions most of the disruptions that we have when things go a little bit off-center when they get a little bit wild one way or the other most of these disruptions are very temporary they last a short time why because the body is in generally in good shape to be able to make those corrections where it needs to make those corrections not too late not too early how does it make those corrections though may you ask yes you can ask the first way is by the nervous system. The nervous system will spend a lot of time about talking about this makes rapid changes. Okay, if if somebody comes up behind you and says "boo," it scares you. Okay, what happens is all of a sudden you feel your heart racing. Your heart rate your heart rate goes up. Uh, you start breathing faster. Your blood pressure goes up. I didn't do that. That just happened because it was a rapid response by my nervous system to be able to send nervous signals out to increase my heart rate, increase my breathing rate, increase my blood pressure so I could run. Okay? So I could have more power to run. Okay? On the other hand, the endocrine system works as well to try to change these temporary disruptions. But the problem with the endocrine system is it sometimes takes a little bit longer time for that to happen. Let's take an example for this. What happens is if 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 uh, I eat something uh, and we break it down to let's say glucose, a glucose low, just for the sake of simplicity, what I'm going to find is my blood sugar levels will go up. They start to go up. Okay, these blood sugar levels are going to go up, and then eventually they start to come down. Why do they come down? Because for the for the blood sugar levels to come down, they have to get inside the cell. How do they get inside the cell? They get inside the cell because insulin is produced by the pancreas that binds to the receptors on the cells. But what happens? It takes a while after that stimulus of the blood sugar going up for the pancreas to say, "Okay, we need another load of insulin to the body. Let's ship it out." What happens is the insulin then is put into the circulation, into the blood, circulates around through the blood, goes to the cells, binds to the receptors, opens the gates, lets the glucose in. That takes a while. So as a result, the endocrine system takes a while. It's more gradual changes, but sometimes very long-lasting changes. Okay. So both the nervous system and the endocrine system work together to try to keep the body in that homeostatic control. Okay. Now, what does really feedback system what is what is homeostasis it's a series of feedback systems okay and that feedback system that didn't look that good did it okay let me get rid of that let's do something a different color let's do uh, light green okay the feedback system the feedback systems are, are such that what happens is we don't want to have too much of a correction or too little okay and a feedback system is basically a cycle of events which allows a monitoring of something when something is out of that normal it evaluates it as being out of that normal and then causes some type of an action that will produce an effect okay and that will continue on until we get back into normal you know and that normal would be called a controlled condition when I get back to that controlled condition then all of a sudden this circle this feedback stops everything is back to normal okay so we have a stimulus a stimulus finds that disruption sends that stimulus to a control center the control center then actually uh, decides if it's normal or abnormal or if it's good if it's bad and then sends out a signal to something called an effector and effector does the job let's talk and show you what this is all about first let's talk about let's talk about first of all that receptor that receptor is constantly sampling everything we have receptors in the surface of the skin we have receptors in our blood vessels in the blood vessels they're called baroreceptors and they, they detect the amount of pressure that the blood puts on the wall of the vessel because the wall is starting to stretch and dilate out and so these baroreceptors will detect that so the, the receptor monitors for changes it's sort of like that that sentinel that guy that sits on top of the hill and says let me watch let me see if there's you know you keep watch the first hour up there with the little uh, binocular seeing and stuff like that everything looks cool everything is cool wait a minute I see some motion out there past the, in the woods out over there and they get that so they, they what happens is they see something look for changes and that's what this receptor does then what the receptor does is when it sees a change it sends the input to the control center which is primarily neural why neural because it's faster okay it works fast okay what happens in the brain 
there's an area in the brain in sort of like the middle of the brain okay the bottom part but sort of like in the middle not the right side not the left side but in the middle it's called the hypothalamus and this hypothalamus is sort of like the master of all masters it's constantly taking the information from the receptors and evaluating that information it looks at all my body chemistries so it looks at everything that's going on my body temperature my my uh, rate of oxygen exchange my carbon dioxide levels it looks at everything okay and what it does it has within itself a set range of normal okay what it knows what's normal and what's not normal so therefore this area in the brain the hypothalamus most commonly evaluates the input and if it's abnormal it sends out a signal either hormonally or neuro, uh, neurally okay to what's called an effector now the effector then makes the change. The effector receives the output from the control center and produces a response to cause a change in the condition. Perfect. And this will continue to go until we get back to normal. When we get back to normal, all of a sudden it stops in most cases. And then this this thing here on, on the this little flowchart says, you know, stimulus up in here. Uh, what happens? It's controlled, you know, monitored by, you know, it's, uh, so the receptors feel something and they see something's wrong. They send a signal to the control center. The control center decides if it's right or wrong. If it's wrong, it sends a signal to the effectors. The effectors do something. And eventually that feeds back up into here to get it back to normal. And that's what these feedback mechanisms basically are all about. Okay. Now, this is a, called a feedback loop. Okay. And it's basically that coordination between the receptor, the control center, and the effector. I don't want that feedback or I don't want that response to be excessive because then now I've created a whole new set of problems. Okay. I want to get back to normal. Why? Because the body always likes to be the same all the time. Homeostasis. I don't want to have it too little. And I don't have it too much. Okay, I don't want them. To, I don't want them either. So we have two types of feedback. One feedback is called negative feedback, and the other feedback is called positive feedback. Okay, what does this mean? What's negative feedback and positive feedback? Negative feedback. What happens is if something goes wrong, okay, it causes and reverses the change in some type of a controlled condition. Let me take an example. Here we have the blood pressure. Now blood pressure is elevated. Let's say the blood pressure for some reason goes up. What that does, it puts pressure on these baroreceptors or these sensory receptors in the surface or in the walls of these of the of the vessels. They get stretched out. If it's too high, if the pressure is too high, these baroreceptors re uh, understand that. And what they do is they send a signal saying, "Hey, I think something's wrong here. I think the pressure is a little high. I think we're gonna blow." Here pretty soon. So as a result, what happens is it sends a signal to the nervous system, usually in the in the lower portion of the nervous system called the medulla oblongata, which is at the in the brainstem, which does a lot of the cardiovascular and uh, blood pressure control in the in the medulla oblongata. And the uh, medulla oblongata says, "Yeah, you're right. It's a little high." And then what happens? The brain then sends out a signal through a nerve, usually what's called the vagus nerve, from that point. And what it does is it decreases the heart rate and causes the vessels to dilate. What does that do? It lowers the blood pressure. When the blood pressure is reduced to normal, we stop. That's the end of it. No more. It gets to that point, and that's it. Okay? And that's called negative feedback. I get back to normal, and then it stops. Okay? And it will constantly monitor it, but what happens is I don't need to keep on sending out a signal to lower the blood pressure when the blood pressure is back to normal. And that's called negative feedback. It stops when it, when it gets to a certain point. Now, positive feedback is another type of feedback system we have, but it's not very common. <clears throat> Most of the feedback mechanisms that we have in the body are negative feedback. And this is what, hap what happens with the positive feedback. It actually keeps on strengthening and strengthening and strengthening until there's no reason for it to strengthen anymore. Typical example of a positive feedback is, is let's say, a lady's going into labor, and the baby's head's coming down the birth canal. What it does is it stretches out the tissue at the bottom end of the uterus, which is called the cervix. It stretches it out. The stretch on the cervix is detected by stretch receptors in that tissue. And what it does, that feeds back to the brain. And in the brain, there's a small little gland called the pituitary gland, about the size of the little tip of your finger, about the size of a pea that hangs from the base of the brain. It's called the pituitary blank, a gland right behind the eyes. And that gland uh, actually secretes a hormone called oxytocin. Oxytocin then goes down, gets in the circulation because it's a hormone. Hormones get in the blood blood circulation, goes down at, and, and goes and is, has specialized to go to the uterine muscle and causes the uterine muscle to contract and squeeze. So when a female is having those contractions, the contractions are because of the pitocin, because of the cervix stretching. Guess what happens? It doesn't shut it off. 
So all of a sudden it says, okay, contract. It contracts and then it stops. No, they want those contractions to keep on going and to keep on magnifying. Why? Because they got to get that baby out of there. Okay, let's get rid of this thing. Boom, we want to have that baby delivered. So as a result, until the baby is delivered past the cervix and the cervix back comes back to normal, the oxytocin keeps on building and building and building and building and building to increase that strength of the uterine contractions to cause more force to force the baby out the uterus. Okay, and that's until so that continues and that's so it gets higher and higher and higher and higher and higher until the need for that's gone and that's called a positive feedback system. Okay, so that's what this, this is all about. Homeostatic imbalance. Okay, and one last thing, and I'll let you go for this time. Homeostatic imbalance occurs in some situations. Okay, and basically, when things can't get back to normal, okay, uh, it results in certain times things called signs and symptoms. Okay. Uh, and that's frequently associated with disease. So a disorder disease may affect homeostatic balance or homeostatic imbalance may produce disorder or disease. So it goes both ways. It's a, it's a two-way street here. You know, either disease or disorder may affect the homeostatic imbalance or balance or homeostatic imbalance may produce disease or disorder. Okay. And what happens is in this situation, the body is system or process is un, it loses the ability to control and we lose our homeostasis. And that is a horrible thing to happen. What that does, it produces two things. Okay. It produces one thing called symptoms. Symptoms are things or complaints that people will tell you. Okay. Let's say I feel my heart fluttering a little bit. Now that's a complaint. Now that's a symptom. Okay. On the other hand, if I take a stethoscope and listen and I hear the heart go it's going a crazy rhythm and it's fluttering, I can hear it flutter, that's a sign because I can actually detect that by a physical change by an examiner. So when you hear symptoms, symptoms are things that patients or people complain of. Signs are things that are actually observable by an examiner. Okay, so anyway, what we've done here so far is we've gone over some of the basic life processes that we have, as well as homeostasis. Homeostasis is the key to life. We want everything to be the same all the time. And we're going to be talking about homeostatic control from now until the cows come home. Okay, that's if you, that's if you, own, if you don't own, own a farm, you know, trust a farmer. He'll tell you when the cows came home. But we're going to talk about cow this forever. Okay, about homeostasis. Almost every time, every th every section we're going to talk about, we're going to mention something about homeostasis because the body likes to be the same all the time. And this is what happens. And this is how all this happens. So hopefully this didn't confuse you totally. And hopefully you didn't all of a sudden after the first 15 minutes run for the door saying I'm done with this stuff. And hopefully uh, you'll pay. This this will make sense to you because this is the basis of physiology altogether.